Hello everyone, Sanjay Saint here, and I'm really glad that you could uh, join me for a discussion of acute kidney injury. This is uh, based on um, the book, The St. Chopra Guide to Inpatient Medicine, that I um, worked on with my colleague, Vineet Chopra. So let me just give you some background information about acute kidney injury. The definition is a rapid decrease in glomerular filtration that results in abnormal fluid and electrolyte balance and azotemia. And the diagnosis is usually made when the serum creatinine level rises abruptly. There's many different types of definitions. I'll first give you the formal definitions, then I'll give you the practical one that we tend to use in hospitalized patients. The formal definitions is that acute kidney injury is defined by either an increase in serum creatinine by 0.3 in 48 hours or an increase in serum creatinine by one and a half times baseline within seven days or a decrease in urine output to less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour for six hours. I'll tell you practically what we usually do is if we see because we get QAM labs if the patient's creatinine increases by roughly 0.3 or 0.5 in a 24-hour period, we think to ourselves, this person has acute kidney injury. Most of the time, patients with acute kidney injury, which happens about 2% of all hospitalized patients, will be asymptomatic. Most of the time, they will be asymptomatic unless their BUN starts approaching 100, at which times they may have symptoms of uremia. And those symptoms can be remembered kind of from the head to the gut. CNS would be coma, confusion, seizures. Cardiovascular would be pericarditis, fluid overload, arrhythmias. And then GI would be anorexia, nausea, vomiting, GI bleeding because of dysfunctional platelets, which sometimes occurs in uremic patients. Um, and as we will talk about at the end, these nonspecific findings should especially in a patient who's got a BUN that approaches 100, should make you think, ah, they're uremic and therefore they need acute hemodialysis. The best way to approach um, acute kidney injury is anatomically, thinking about it as pre-renal, intrarenal, and post-renal. And we'll kind of go through that one at a time. The first and the most common cause of acute kidney injury are pre-renal causes. And pre-renal causes really are pre-glomerular causes, but we just call them pre-renal. And I think of this anatomically from the left ventricle all the way to the level of the glomerulus. Anything that decreases perfusion at the level of the glomerulus can lead to pre-renal acute kidney injury. So that's decreased filling of the left ventricle because of dehydration due to diarrhea or vomiting or third spacing. Poor forward flow because of heart failure. Uh, critical aortic stenosis leading to decreased forward flow. Renal artery stenosis either due to atherosclerosis or fibromuscular dysplasia, and then issues related to the afferent and efferent arteriole, um, where you can have perturbations there that lead to decreased perfusion, such as sepsis or contrast dye, hepatorenal syndrome, or certain medications like NSAIDs. So that's all under the category of pre-renal acute kidney injury. And clues that someone has pre-renal would be that they have a high BUN to creatinine ratio rather than 10 to 1. It would be 15 to 1 or 20 to 1. Their urinalysis is bland. Their fractional excretion of sodium shows that they're very sodium avid. So their phena is less than 1%. If they're on diuretics, we would then use ethiurea. That'd be less than 30 or 35%. Um, and, but, and one of the best approaches though is that we tend to give these patients fluids and see if they respond. The exception to this rule would be cardiorenal syndrome where patients are already fluid overloaded and they're on the other end of the startling curve. So fluids would be contraindicated. In these types of patients, you would actually diurese them, which would improve their startling dynamics, increase cardiac output, and therefore in, in, improve uh, perfusion at the level of the kidney. Pre-renal accounts for a large percentage of acute kidney injuries is the first thing that you think about when someone has acute kidney injury. The other extreme are post-renal causes. These are relatively unusual. They account for the, uh, a small number, but they're important to rule out after uh, a few days in order to avoid long-standing kidney damage. And again, we approach these anatomically. Start with 
the urethra, work your way up to the uh, bladder, ur the ureters, and then the renal pelvises. Blockage along all that path, anywhere on that pathway can lead to obstructive uropathy or post-renal acute kidney injury. So this would include urethral strictures in male, a large prostate, bladder problems that lead to mechanical obstruction like bladder tumor, bladder polyp, bladder hematoma, bladder cancer, bladder stone, um, or non-mechanical or neurogenic causes like multiple sclerosis, injured spinal cord, diabetes, and certain medications. Ureteral problems include things like renal stones, uh, lymphadenopathy, retroperitoneal fibrosis, for example, the IgG4-related disease. Um, and if you have two functioning kidneys, though, one will be able to compensate, but many patients do not, um, and therefore you can see a rising creatinine even with a unilateral uh, kidney stone, for example. The approach here is to do an ultrasound to rule out hydronephrosis, and if you see hydronephrosis, you get urology or interventional radiology involved for stentine or uh, percutaneous nephrostomy tubes. And then finally, intrarenal causes. This is, I believe, I realize an opaque box, but we can make this easier to understand by thinking about the four things that live within the kidney. The first are tubules that live in the kidney, and this is ATN. Uh, ATN is usually due to something, some type of an insult, shock, severe hypotension, ischemia, contrast dye, sepsis, uh, hemoglobinuria, myoglobinuria, medications like immunoglycosides. And um, clues that someone has ATN will be that their BON to creatinine ratio is now normalized, their urine shows muddy brown granular tubular casts, their FENA is greater than 3%, their FEurea, if they're on diuretics, greater than 50%, and they don't respond or only partially respond to a fluid challenge. When I'm thinking someone has ATN, I always get nephrology involved so they can confirm the diagnosis. Most patients will then get better before they need dialysis, but it's just something that you want to, uh, to think about because it's a common cause of acute kidney injury, especially in patients in the ICU. Glomerular causes, here we're talking about acute glomerulonephritis, which is inflammation of the glomerulus, and this can be due to many different uh, causes, things such as lupus, um, cryoglobulinemia, vasculitis, uh, good pastures uh, disease, MPGN, and, and the like. Um, clues that someone has glomerulonephritis is that they're going to have a rising creatinine, new hypertension, um, they'll have a little bit of proteinuria, but usually not nephrotic range proteinuria, so it'll be less than three or three and a half grams in a 24-hour period. They'll see, you'll see red blood cell casts or dysmorphic red blood cells, and sometimes patients will even say that they're urinating blood. You'll want to biopsy these patients early because we'll need to give them immunosuppressants and getting um, nephrology to see this patient soon will be important. The third are interstitial causes here. It's really acute or allergic interstitial nephritis, uh, usually due to drugs or sometimes a viral infection. And because it's allergic to something, eosinophils tend to proliferate. You can see it in the blood and you can see it in the urine, but you don't always need to see it. Usually withholding the offending agent uh, will cause this process to go away. And then finally, vascular causes. Um, and here I'm talking about vascular causes other than those that involve the, glomerular, uh, the glomerulus. So this would be HUSTTP, or hemolytic uremic syndrome, and uh, TTP, which are the thrombotic microangiopathies. I'm lumping them together um, even though I know because of Adams TS13 activity, they're distinct. But HUS has a triad of HUS, hemolysis, uremia, and thrombocytopenia, but the S is silent. And TTP has those three things, plus fever and neurological changes. And for TTP, the management is plasmapheresis. And then the final vascular cause are all the different vasculitides that can involve the, the kidney. And um, there are many different types um, vasculitides that are um, uh, involving different vessel size, and that'll be actually uh, a separate talk uh, down the road. But when I think someone has a vasculitis, I'll get uh, a rheumatologist uh, to help me manage that patient. 
So finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are some indications for acute, acute hemodialysis, and they can be remembered with the mnemonic AEIOU. A is for acidosis that is not being managed appropriately with conservative measures, electrolyte abnormalities, especially hyperkalemia, intoxication to certain drugs that you need to dialyze off, volume overload states, and then finally uremia, which involves, like we discussed, the central nervous system, the cardiovascular system, and the GI system. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Um, I appreciate you watching this video. Have a great day.